have turned the mic on, I think, or not. And the music's off. Fantastic. Good evening. My name's Adam Jefford. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the State Library of Queensland. Uh, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Karilpa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. We proudly continue that tradition here today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the manager of the Asia Pacific Design Library here at SLQ. Proud to say this is uh, the first lecture series that I've got through and I know many of you have attended all eight, so thank you as well for your patronage. Um, just, and, and maybe it'll make you feel better or, or maybe worse, but I wanted to share some of the highlights um, and, and the data, which is a little bit boring in some ways, about the last eight lectures. Um, of course, we're very thankful um, to each and every one of you for coming along every night, but what has been really interesting for us um, in the organisation of these events is the patronage online as well. So we just had a look at the stats for the last seven lectures and there was uh, 4,500 individual viewers who accessed the seven lectures and more than 6,700 minutes of video watched. Um, which for us at the State Library is a new kind of high water mark. Um, so we're really excited. So thank you to each and every one of you here tonight, as well as those viewers who are watching at home on Facebook, and maybe to those viewers in six months' time who are watching that video on Vimeo or have downloaded it because they've been set up for coursework at UQ. <laughs> um, <laughs> that wasn't a bad joke to finish the eight <laughs> lectures on. Um, housekeeping, last time. Toilets, level two, level three. If you do need to leave tonight, um, could I please request that you leave through the back door? Um, if your phones are not on silent, could you please put them on silent? William put his on silent like 10 minutes ago. He was that prepared, so you should take a leaf out of his book. The events, as we mentioned, are being recorded online. We would love for you to tweet the event. Um, Instagram seems to work well, but of course we are on Twitter and Facebook as well if you want to share the love. Um, and of course, after tonight, if you um, feel compelled to write about, reflect on, review the lecture and share it with us, we would love to put it on design online. Um, we've been getting tens of reviews coming in and, and we're very thankfully publishing them. And if you have sent them in, maybe we can turn that 10 into 20 this time. Um, later this evening as well, I need we will announce kind of the weekly winner for the Archive Spy competition as well as the overall winner um, for that fantastic prize, um, which one of our, my colleagues will talk a little bit about later on. But I did want to do just a couple of quick thank yous. Um, I want to thank the staff, the technical staff up in the box behind for making all of this possible. Also wanted to thank my colleagues in the APDL, Shanoa, Anita and Liz. And of course I want to thank UQ for helping us put on this lecture series. And there are many hardworking people there. Um, but in particular I wanted to thank Kelly, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight, um, Fiona and Sandra. Um, also for their efforts and their vision in helping us produce this and get it out to the public. In Kelly's place, um, it's my pleasure to welcome back a familiar face um, to do tonight's MC and introduction of William. Um, so Anthony, if you'd like to come to the stage, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Well, welcome to the eighth and final lecture of the 2017 series. Before I introduce William, Kelly would like me to extend her thanks to all those who've been involved in the coordination of the series. Uh, Fiona McAlpine, uh, Nielsen Berker, Tanya Pina, and Erin Lewis from the School of Architecture, and our series partners at the State Library, Anita Shinoa Gilson, Chris on the AV, and of course, Asia Pacific Design Library Manager, Adam, thanks for that. I'd also like to, of course, warmly thank Kelly uh, for the amazing series she's put together for us. It's been a great success in more ways than are visible, as Adam was just telling you. And so the Design Online website and the school homepage is, can direct you to the lectures if you'd like to see them again. But now on to William's lecture. So William Smart opened his architecture office Smart Design Studio in 1997. He operates out of Surrey Hills in Sydney and the studio has earned a reputation for its highly detailed and refined architecture. As we were downstairs in the cafe just before, we overheard one of the 
people in the cafe say, we have the country's best architect here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the practice has won numerous awards for their architecture and most recently the 2016 AIA Robin Boyd Award for Residential Architecture. I know that William's process of designing is about the hand and the eye through the sketchbooks in which he records and imagines spaces. And as we will see tonight, the resulting architecture mixes the calm and the spectacular. So please join me in welcoming William. Thank you, Anthony and Adam, and, to the, and thank you also to the organisers for tonight and all of you for coming. As I flew down, I thought, no one's going to show up. <laughs> I'll be up here on my own, but that would be fine. I wanted just to talk to you a little bit about our studio tonight and start off with a very, like a sprint view through the kinds of projects we work on and then just go and look at Indigo Slam in a lot of detail. And this is the project that won the Robin Boyd Award and the Wilkinson Award and it's probably been the most exciting point of my life. Smart Design Studio is 45 people and we all work together. We specialise in architecture and interiors and most of our work is residential work. We do houses, and different houses of different scales in different locations, and they're always very detailed. We also do small apartment buildings, and we seek out these projects where we feel that we can be creative and do things out of the box. Some of the projects are high budget, some are low budget. There's always got to be a quality of design. We're starting to do public buildings. This is the Sydney Trains, new headquarters under construction, a hotel, a high rise in the city, and another one at Green Square in Perth. And we also do warehouse conversions for Saatchi's, um, red one in the city, and then interiors. And it's a big part of our job is interior design and we have an idea that that be the start of our projects and our philosophy is architecture from the inside out. So interior designers don't think of the colours, details and materials, they start with the spatial opportunities <coughs> and that's what drives the architecture. This is a church project finished and lastly a boat. So Indigo Slam began in January 2012, and I had a phone call from a lady by the name of Judith Nelson, and I'd worked with her in the past on White Rabbit Gallery in Sydney. And she asked me if I was free and had time to work on her house. She said it had to start that day, and if, if it wasn't me, she was going to call Frank Gehry. <laughs> That's true. She, Judith is a great patron of the arts in Sydney, and she is uh, kind of really changing the cultural dynamics of our city. She's a wonderful person. She bought a warehouse in Chippendale, and Chippendale is the southern edge of what I would describe as Sydney's peninsula of tall buildings. And beyond that point is a conservation area, so that area will not, won't change. And then we have the tall buildings of the city. Uh, at the time when she bought it, uh, a lot of these buildings here weren't built, and she had the vision that this would be a house on a park in the city. And we talked together about what this house might be like and I showed her a couple of books of different projects and she really responded to these very bold, ambitious projects and told me the name of the house was to be Indigo Slam, which is a book that she'd read. And I felt that amongst that name and the response to these bold projects, there was a desire for her to express a new freedom in her life as she was divorcing from her husband. And so I proposed to her that we develop a grid for the house, or a, a language for the house, rather, and that language permeates through everything. And it's described in the pictures that you see at the top. And we simply take a card or a piece of material, and we cut and we fold it. And we run that through everything, like a triangular grid on the Frank Lloyd Wright house, and it binds everything together. It responds to these sculptures that I love, and responds to these um, very sculptural buildings. They were sort of influences at the time. So in many ways the house reads as a sculpture in the city. It's made from concrete and steel and wood and brick, responding to a requirement of the brief that everything lasts for more than 100 years and be as manual as possible 
such as the manual operation of the windows that you see on the outside. I'll describe them later. And you can see through here a house that's configured over three levels, plus a basement. We have on this level a generous dining hall for 60 people, four bedrooms above that, and above that private living and dining room. So the language is this peeling and folding, you can see it in the form, but the architecture is doing everything that a house needs to do. So it's shading the windows on the lower part, it's opening up to create a balcony on the first floor, it has a light scoop that bounces light into the, to the upper rooms of the house, and it opens and closes to create privacy from the neighbouring apartment buildings, and to, to read as kind of a beautiful form in the city. I wanted it to feel like it was not a conventional house. It's not a conventional person, it's not a conventional brief. I felt like it had to respond to that. It changes through the seasons and the different times of the year. So I wanted to just show you how it's constructed. First of all, we have 17 geothermal bores that go 100 metres down into the ground that are used to control the uh, heating and cooling of the house in a very energy efficient way. We have underground tanks, we have a cellar down below. And then, as I mentioned before, we have a, a, a dining hall that seats 60, plus a commercial kitchen and an entry foyer. We have a staircase on the south side of the house, which is the side with no windows because it's fronting neighbouring properties that um, mean we can't put windows in those locations. And it occupies the south side of the house and links all the levels from the bedrooms, which each have en suites up to the top floor, which has a narrow kitchen through the centre of that space, a TV room through that side, and then a living and dining and kitchen area through there. That is uh, um, housed underneath this beautiful sculpting ceiling, which reflects the language of the house. And out the back we have a guest house and a garage, and in between we have a courtyard. Um, the front facade is the, the element I've described earlier, which is this peeling, folding facade, and it's pinned off the building, which means that um, these elements through here are supported by the glazing mullions. So the house has tremendous weight and lightness at the same time, and it's sitting beneath a steel roof with solar panels covering the building. So I thought tonight I'd take you on a tour of the house, starting with the front gate. The front gate is made from Corten steel, and slides down the hill like you were going into a castle. Each of, the, each of these battens is 60 mils wide and is just notched out to show the name of the house from the Corten steel. So that from front on you can't read it, you can only read it from the side and it's quite hard to read if the sun's not shining. You walk in as the gate opens and you walk up three stairs into quite a compressed element and look up to a three-storey high portico, and each floor level is four, four metres apart, so it's a very tall and dramatic entry portico. And if you look to the right, you'll see these brass rods that couple all the shutters of the house together. So all of the glass is fixed so that it's not um, kind of spoiled by uh, hinges or, or, or uh, hardware generally, and all of the panels of the house are openable, so if you wind a handle, six to nine windows will open in series. You come into this beautiful spare entry foyer where no lights can be seen, and you'll notice on the floor there are bricks. These are regular dry press bricks which were made for the house, and again they respond to that requirement of the brief that everything lasts for more than 100 years. Details everywhere follow the, um, the language of the house in the peeling and folding gestures, and on this project, we were lucky enough to make all of the hardware. So we made the door handles, we made every element for the house. And you come past a couple of doors here. One of them is a lift, one is a cellar. And the ceiling at this point is uh, very low. And we measured that to be Judith's hand height when she reaches up into the air. Um, the door on the right opens into a very beautiful lift, very spare. And then the black uh, hallway takes you down into the cellar. The cellar is a brick room underground, and we made these um, vaulted ceilings out of bricks in a traditional way. So they're bearing structural load, and they're real bricks laid up in that way. And then we house the room with very regular racks on these um, columns that are made from very slim um, angles, equal angles. So going back up into the foyer, 
um, we walk past those doors again into the main entry hall, main stair hall of the house. So the, one of the requirements of this house is that it have a very public purpose. So Judith is involved with a whole host of charities and she holds events there on a monthly basis and they will accommodate between 50 and 200 people. And this staircase is kind of a part of that foyer experience of coming into the house. As I mentioned before, it's on the south side, so, so that we use that um, part of the house which has no natural light or, um, or sunlight available to the rooms. We offer that up, the sunlight to the, to the bedrooms, and use this to circulate through the space. The walls in here are unpainted waxed render, and the bricks, as I mentioned before, are the beautiful dry press bricks. The peeling and folding language is what describes the way that the handrails are designed and the balustrades peel and open. And it's largely inspired by projects like, like Utzon's Bugsfart Church. And then beautiful austere spaces by John Pawson as well. So coming back into that space, we'll walk down this hallway past the stair details where you notice small vents that allow you to manually control the, the fresh air coming into the space. If you slide that little handle, the holes will either line up or misalign to open and close the vent. And there's a, that's a great image of the wax render, so it's got this beautiful kind of shell-like quality to it. We go into the dining hall space through this, and you'll notice at the top of the image there a glass bridge so in some ways the house is very low-tech and very crafted, and in other ways it's quite high-tech, so there's glass there with no structure in that area. In through to the room, and you'll notice that the furniture um, is consistent through the house, many different species of wood, but this was all designed and made by a wonderful craftsman by the name of Kai Lu from Adelaide. And the, the table is made from two halves of a tree, so that she bought a very long tree and we cut it and sculpted that shape out of it. So it's one solid piece of wood. So this room, as I mentioned before, has a dining table for 60, and at the end there's a very significant artwork um, by a Russian painter of Noah's Ark. Looking back the other way, you can see that peeling and, lang and folding language will bind the elements of the room together. On the right side through here, there are very large panels, and the, the, the batten space um, acoustic attenuation there, so it controls its acoustic well, and there's, it's hard to see there, but there's red leather in the back of those spaces. And it opens up through to the hallway, and then if you close off the room, the colours there are taken from the, the beautiful painting at the end of the room. And there, there it is illuminated at night. And so we'll go back out of that space, back into the hallway. I think like with most of these projects, we didn't really know how it was going to be used. I just know that Judith has one of the largest art collections in the country. And a large part of this project was for her to house some artworks. So along the way, she bought significant pieces like, I'll go backwards, the blue piece at the end. We had to find a home for that, where she wanted it. It wouldn't fit, it was too big. And then at the end of the room, she had another piece which she really loved. It's a traditional Chinese landscape. But when you get up close, you realise it's made from about 900 nails that are punched into that back wall. So her idea of this project was that it was going to house a lot of art, and as the architecture unfolded, she felt that it was, uh, in her words, too powerful to take it. So, um, so she pulled back the amount of art, and we talked about ways of offering it up in a permanent way. So all of the artwork is installed um, forever in her mind and it's all bolted to the wall. And you can see with details like this, that same language of peeling and folding is adapted to suit the artworks. It's always in a different way. So this right-hand line responds to the centre of that vaulted room and the left-hand line is a way of trying to hold that piece of artwork up. And then you look back into this is the top floor spaces into more areas of the house and then back down through the vaulted space. So I mentioned before that this side of the building uh, has neighbours butting up to that so we can't put walls in. So we brought 
brought the light in from above. And that same language of peeling and folding is used to express light in different ways. Some of the skylights face north, some of them face south, with they're in different ways so that they are brighter or more subtle at the different times of the year with how the light moves around. But it's always got this beautiful, calm quality to the space. It's kind of extraordinary. This is obviously the staircase down on, on through the space, again with the brick on the floors, light from above. And at the end of the room there, we have a, a Juliet balcony. And if you stand on that Juliet balcony, you come onto the axis of the void. So I thought we'd go up there. And that's how it looks. So again, it's adapting the same language, peeling and folding. And at that point, you stand up at this part of the house, look past um, the pantry, and powder room into the kitchen area. And Judith's idea of this kitchen area is that she can see her friends while she's cooking, but no one can see her. And she loves to cook, so we just have it closed off uh, and separated from the main space, except for that little opening in the wall, and it's top lit from above. Um, the bench tops are made from a product called super white granite, so it's just a very kind of simple granite and very large sculpted edges. Um, to, to make all the cupboards easy to open. And through the house we use always, the timber in the architecture is always oak, but there's about six different finishes. We change it subtly in each room. And there's the details of the bench top through there. And then the opening through there is made from the same granite. It's, it's laminated pieces, it's not one single block. And it opens up in a beautiful way. So you can see with all these details, that the, that the ideas of the architecture are coming through in every element of the house, and that's looking from the other side. This is the main, the, her main dining space upstairs. So she has a dining table for 16, and a little lounge area at the end of that. And she loves to have people around. She's a kind of very open person who'll um, ask you to come around after uh, you've had a meal to have a chat. What, we, what, what I tried to create with this room was a very kind of bright summary room in the city that addressed privacy from the neighbouring apartment buildings that had this beautiful kind of sunny quality to it. And one of the ways we did that was to um, use this light scoop on the architecture to bounce light above the ceiling. So if you look on, um, what is it, your left-hand image, you'll see a, a maroon line, and that window above there is offered up to the light scoop, which has a white surface on the underside to bounce light on the underside. The result of that is that the shadows are very light in that space. It has this kind of lovely milky light quality to it at all times of the day. We also have a clerestory at the, at the southern side of that room that bounces light back into it through another direction. And then these blinds um, that um, open and close that space off. There's a very long window in that area. And these are the kind of wonderful um, pieces of furniture that were commissioned for the house. Every piece of furniture was made for the project. And it's pretty much used how I thought. I always thought the blinds would be extended but opened up so you can look out. This is the TV room through here. Again kind of crazy furniture. And this shows how the windows open and close, the blinds open and close in their different configurations. So responding to this requirement of the brief that everything be manual made our lives very challenging. So we found someone who could make these large vertical blinds, if you like, um, but we wanted them made from solid wood with an aluminium substrate, and we wanted them to manual. And he had only had that available with electric motors and the idea of it being manual is that maybe in 50 years' time you won't better buy the electric motor anymore to repair it. And Judah felt that everything in the house needed to last for a long time. So we worked with this um, manufacturer for about a year on making everything manual in this system. And therefore there's a lot of prototyping that goes with that as well. We're back in the stair hall here, and we'll go down to the bedroom level. So you cross over the glass bridge, which has no structure. The handrails through there are wrapped in white leather. 
and then there's beautiful details that, that feel like they're a part of the house. And when I was designing and planning it, I felt like I was, in a way, designing a palace, really. It's, it's that kind of scale. It has those kind of grand gestures. You arrive at amazing moments. There's senses of symmetry. There's moments of wow. There's that classic idea of compression and release in how you move through the architecture. So circulation, as well as detail, was very important. Most of the bedrooms are configured like this. So you'll come in through a walk-through robe, and behind the bed head is uh, an ensuite bathroom. Each of the rooms has a different view out to the city. So this bedroom cannot look out to the park, but can only look up to the sky or down to the ground behind that curved piece of concrete. And as a result of that, it has these beautiful patterns of light and shadow that fall on the concrete and surprisingly enough light coming into that room. This room has vertical windows that look down a new laneway in the city or back to the centre of the park. This is the, uh, a room for, for grandchildren and has a long panoramic view to the city. And then these are the blinds that open and close in different configurations in that space. And then this is the master bedroom which is a larger room with a little desk and an ottoman. And behind the bed is the ensuite bathroom, and the way to get to it is on the right-hand side. So before I mention these uh, winders of the windows, how they work is that you can see through there, the glass is fixed. You can also see faintly through the glass that the concrete on the outside is pinned off the glazing mullions. So it's supported in an extraordinary way. And what you don't capture in the photographs is that feeling of weight and lightness at the same time. So you can look over the top of that sloping concrete element or look underneath it. Now, when you wind the handles, all of those shutters in the room are linked together. And uh, you can open them at the top to let the hot air out and at the bottom to let the, the, the cool air in and ventilate that window space. And then we have mesh there to control insects. Um, I, these were, it was probably one of those projects where I, th I got about halfway through it and thought, oh, I've really started something, it's too hard. <laughs> it was very difficult, but I kind of worked my way through all of these components and designed them all, and they were all made in the, the um, lost wax casting, and then machined after that. So you can see the name Indigo Slam is in the handle, and then every piece of machinery on there is expressed, and they all look like they're the same, but there's probably a thousand different components in the whole system and um, it was hard to do and it was inspired by this project I've worked on in Sydney uh, to restore these old medical suites in the city and they have the same kind of handles but they theirs are a lot smaller and they work through a bay window as well they're beautiful and they, this is uh, 80 years old and is working wonderfully today this is the ensuite bathroom space, and the kind of uh, calmness and clarity of that space and the comfortableness is what we wanted to translate to it. So behind those mirrored, uh, mirrors on the wall are cabinets built into the wall. There are no glass shower screens. Um, there are little shelves to put shampoo. And um, the drawers are uh, concealed behind the marble fronts through there. Little details there, laundry taps from Paula. And then through there, we made a, um, a shower and a bath space together. So we made this bath um, in New Zealand, just out of beaten copper with handrail parts so an older lady can get out of the bath and a little corner to sit on where you're having a shower. And then a, a slot view to the park so you could look out to see what the day was like whilst you had privacy in that space. And then again, we try to uh, make the projects look sort of low-tech in a way, so the water drains into that gap between the tiles. And the heated tower rails don't look like heated tower rails. And that looks through to the road beyond that. The other um, en-suites in the house kind of have a similar language, but each one of them is slightly different. This one has marble-fronted tall doors to the cabinets and then looking back from the shower space through there. 
and then quite simple bar, the sitting and walls that are just very slightly curved at the ends. And then different bathrooms in different spaces. So I thought we'd go out and have a look at the guest house. It's only been recently finished, so there aren't great photographs of that. But that's leaving the main space. And kind of beautiful light in those areas. So the guest house has a similar language. The main house has all of its um, architecture going horizontally to allow the sun, the winter sun to come in and the summer sun to shield the glass. Um, this side of the house on the right faces south and so all of its design is in a vertical orientation and, and the obsession there is privacy from the neighbours. So it's, it's built into a street of working class terraces and um, and then the architecture is drawing alignments from that, but focusing views down the street and not across the road. And there's a garage integrated into that space as well. So a garage downstairs and a guest apartment above that. And then a couple of trees through here. It's quite a nice story. We, we, went, um, we spoke to three different landscape architects, one after the other, and they kept coming up with ideas for the house. And I just didn't think any of them were really right. And... Um, the, 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 the third one said to me, I know a young guy, you should talk to him, I think you'll like his idea. And I told him about the house, we had a coffee, and he had this idea that he came back with as a concept called a companion for a thousand years, knowing that the brief of the house has to last a hundred years. And he decided to plant two ginkgo trees side by side, and he tells me they're the oldest tree in the world, and cut, cut out the space between the two of them. So they'll always sit like brothers or sisters side by side with an empty space between the two of them. I think it's a beautiful idea. That's it starting to grow. Um, we um, help Judith coordinate the positions for all the sculptures and make plinths for all of those as well. And you can see the space between the two trees. They're planted at different heights, so they'll grow at different rates. And then these are kind of little views out from different parts of the house. So that's looking up into the guest house through there. I think for me, um, all of the houses turned out very much like what I imagined, except for the light. I'm unable to imagine what light is like. And I think um, what I think is really beautiful about it is the way it captures light and surprises me and a lot of other people. Um, I think that's probably the greatest success of the house. This is um, a reflection pool at the front that's intended to bounce light up onto the, to the walls, but I was, I was surprised it bounces light up onto the ceilings inside the rooms and kind of gives you this ever-changing, beautiful light. At the front, I mean, it's sort of captured here with um, a poem that we, we put into the bottom of the pond, um, and it's adapted from a song that I really like, and I bounced it back with Judith, backwards and forwards, and then we turned it into this poem. So I thought um, to finish the talk tonight, I might just um, show some images of the construction and drawings and read something that I wrote. I was asked recently to do an occasional address at the UTS graduation and it forced me to really think a bit about my career, about our industry, about what we do and I thought I'd share with you an adaptation of that. I feel very privileged to be here today and to be honest, a little out of place. I come from an ordinary background, not the right, wrong side of the tracks or a famous lineage. I'm not a writer or a talker. I'm more of a drawer and a dreamer. I recognize that we're living in a, tremendous, a time of tremendous opportunity. Our population is growing and buildings surround us. And much of this is of the highest international standards. We, of course, many, have many extraordinary architects such as Merkert, Woodson, Boy, uh, Boyd and Seidler who have established these foundations which are further underpinned by the work of our dedicated architectural community. And the role that we have is to embrace the opportunities that come our way in our own way and make the best built environment that we can, possibly can. I say in our own way because our profession requires all different kinds of designers. Some are creative, others are great at business, or others are strong on detail, 
or some can be great managers and organisers. And we, meet, we need them all. So my advice to young people is to find your niche and become great at that. I imagine most of you are here tonight because of your love of great design and probably because you've engaged with something that's more than a job or even a career. Architecture, for most of us, is a vocation, like a calling that you'd see with a professor, nurse or athlete, and is incredibly satisfying. And what is so wonderful about this particular vocation is that what we imagine and then draw actually is built and created. We create physical objects that endure for many years and shape our cities and public places, and as well as that interiors that shape our lives. It's a role with tremendous responsibility as well as wonderful opportunity. This message was really driven home to me recently when one of my friends enrolled to study his, um, his passion, interior design. It took him many years to leave his successful career in banking because of its prestige and financial reward and start studying again. And, but I now see him with a, a new energy and vitality and drive that I've never seen before. He only regrets that he hadn't done it sooner. But it's also a job that can be incredibly tough, especially if your goal is to get amazing results. I always knew that I would fight with builders and engineers, but I never imagined a world of project managers, developers, design and construct development, and a world where mistakes happen all the time. You need to be very thick-skinned and very determined. You need to know when to stand your ground and at all times keep your eye on the end result. I went to see a great Chilean landscape designer, Teresa Moller, talk at the AIA. She does amazing work and has incredible clients like the founders of Google. At the end of this extraordinary presentation, someone from the audience asked if it were easier in South America and she really started to laugh. And she said, you can't imagine how much of this is all a fight. She went to say also that sometimes she just does things that she's told not to just because she thinks it's right. The client will say, do not do that, and she'll do it anyway. And I've noticed this pattern, that most famous designers have to push really hard to do great work. Great design is the result of a vision and a conspiracy of circumstances and participants. It's an amazing testament to a team's ability to join forces and make something special. It requires collaboration and is naturally susceptible to the quality of that collaboration. I look at this as impressive and acknowledge the difficulty of coordinating such large numbers of people to provide their trade at the exact time to the required quality. Working on Indigo Slam was a dream commission for us, and thanks to Judith Nielsen. It was a very ambitious project with a result of tremendous teamwork. I'd be lying if I said it was easy. It wasn't. There were tears, there were difficult moments, there were arguments, as well as moments of great joy, but it was worth every second of it. Nearly 30 years ago, I completed university and then followed my, the advice of my parents to go off to Europe to work and explore with vague plans and little savings. By a stroke of, sheer, a stroke of luck and sheer bravado, I found a job in the south of France I was really looking for an adventure at that point in my life, but found so much more there. And through completely unplanned um, uh, accidents, really, I, 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 this experience in France landed me a job in Norman Foster's office in London when it was very small. And after five years there, I decided to return to Australia and work on an Olympic project, which is where I met John. Um, that was the last thing I did before starting my own practice 20 years ago. And now that I look back, it all seems like the dots connect together beautifully, but at the time they all seem like flukes, connected by unbridled confidence. And the, the will to, and, 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 and the lack of shyness, really, to ask for what I wanted or what opportunity presented in front of me. So at this time, this a little bit, but I might um, confiscate the clicker. <laughs> And these are shots of building Indigo Slam, which is uh, something we're dreaming of now, is making a book about the construction of it that shows the teamwork, that shows you know, the kind of amazing moments 
Because it was a dream project, I went to site every second day for about three years. And I was up on all that scaffolding, checking all the form ties, and checking that everything was in alignment perfectly. I think that's a great photo there. You can see the formwork that's held up for the concrete off the glazing mullions. And that was the most difficult pour of concrete of the lot. We lost a vibrator into the concrete. <laughs> There's one still in there. This is prototyping all of those folding parts and then building the spaces. And then up on that. None of us were wearing harnesses or safety gear. That's great. And then building the barrel vaulted space and then gradually this kind of pile of scaffold um, started to come down and then you saw this kind of great building and building the staircase. This is our wonderful old engineer who's an old friend of mine who's down there every second day as well. And then building the spaces. So you can see it's a very rough and dirty building site for most of the time. And then up into the ceiling, the geothermal um, heating and cooling, the baths taking shape. So all of these um, things that turn the, the windows now have gone to a dark brown colour. The, the brass is all oxidised. Again, all the materials respond to that brief, so they must last for long periods of time. We made all these little parts for the house, so the floor boxes are made, so they'd be the perfect size of a brick. And then the handles. And then when it was starting to be revealed, we kind of were surprised by the beautiful qualities of light that were revealed to us. We always thought that light would be um, lovely, but it never turned out as we imagined. And that's the end. Thanks, William. I'll now invite John de Manancourt, UQ Architecture Academic, to come up on stage. Please welcome John. Thanks. Am I on? I am on. Um, it's going to take me a few minutes to recover. Right? It's a kind of essential overload. I actually feel a little bit dirty. I feel like I've watched a movie of insight into Judith's life that I probably, you know, it's like the, the movie that you, you don't want your teenagers to watch, but there are no characters. Um, so I did a bit of Google stalking, um, even though I've known William for a very long time. Um, first thing I realised that in all the publicity shots he wears a white shirt, so I've worn a black shirt. Um, but in a lot of the publicity about Indigo Slam, there's only the AFR article has photos of Judith. And I wanted to start with a question about this idea of occupation. Um, I don't really want to talk too much about the building because I've got other questions, but you talk about Judith this and Judith that and the occupation of the house. And I want you to describe for us a photo shoot that will probably never happen of all the people in the house. Because obviously they're all you know, rich people who don't want their photos taken. But um, I just wonder what it's like when it's full, right? All this idea of occupation, of grandchildren, of parties for 60 or 80 people, um, yet it is, until we saw the construction shots, it was completely lifeless other than the beautiful light, which is obviously stunning. So tell us a bit about that photo shoot. How would you create, curate that shot? Mm. Who's going to play Judith if it's not her? <laughs> um, that's a, uh, that's a, I think what, what I want to say first of all is that the house operates in many different modes. So there is that uh, time when it is, you know, they had the opening of the Biennale there, so there was 200 people um, in the space at that time, and that ended up with... Um, you know, 20 or 30 people sitting on Judith's carpet upstairs on the floor drinking whiskey. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's that kind of house. Why don't we and get to see those photos? Yeah, I'd like, love to. Um, yeah. 
It'd be nice to do that yeah. as well. You can look at her. Uh, she's White Hot Rabbit on Instagram. You can see quite a lot of wi whiskey drinking in that, yeah. in that place. Maybe that's the slideshow that we should see. Yeah. But I think if I was to curate it, it would be that kind of moment where there are people, uh, all different kinds of people from different places. Um, I, I uh, mentor a boy at uh, UTS, and he told me that he went to White Rabbit Gallery one day with their lecturers because they said, you guys don't know how to design a gallery, come and look at a gallery and see how it all works. And as they were leaving, Judith was there and she said, this is what we wanted to do and this is how it works. This is just a coincidence. And then she had them all up inside the house. She said, well, do you want to come and look at my house? Do you want to come and have a look around? And she'll show them the bathroom and the loo and in every part of the house, she's just very open in that way. So I think the image would be that. Mm. Um, it would be very, you know, the neighbors across the road. Mm in one of those working class cottages, but also it would be Penelope Seidler there as well, or one of her you know, rich and fancy friends. So my, my challenge is therefore to do a slideshow with just Judith's Instagram feed, because yeah. it, it would tell a very different story yeah. about, yeah. other than the purity. Yeah. Um, but as William mentioned, we worked together, not on the same projects, but in the same office, um, I didn't realise it was 20 years ago. Um, and it was at a period where a lot of people were actually leaving London the likes of Nigel Greenhill, um, Kevin Curran and uh, Hugh Turner, who's been part of the lecture series. And we worked together at Hassel, which for about six months was known as Foster's Light. Right. Um, but, I, you know, you mentioned your moment of working with Foster and Partners, but um, you did tell me a little sneaky story about Rem and your passion for working for him. So can you share that? Because it's a pretty funny story. And then mm. I'll get a little bit more serious. Mm. Um, I... I, I sort of, um, when I finished studying, I thought, I really want to go and travel and I want to work for amazing people. And um, I had my heart set on the OMA and working in Rotterdam for Rem Coolhouse. And, uh, you know, I wrote to them, but they didn't respond. And I wrote to other architects that I liked. No one responded. And um, just in, then I started calling. <laughs> And, William uh, is obsessive, if you yeah. haven't worked that out. <laughs> and it wasn't just sort of... I ended up just thinking, oh, I can't get through reception, can't do anything. I'll just call late at night. And one night I called very late, and Rem Coolhouse picked up the phone himself. And he said, what is it you want? And I said, I want to work for you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I said, how do I make that happen? He said, what languages do you speak? And I said, English, that's it. And he said, you need to speak French, you need to speak German. And then once you learn those languages, you can have a job in our office. And, um, and that's sort of one of the inspirations for going to France and, and working there for a while. Yeah. Um, so when we worked together, you mentioned at Farewell Drinks this idea of a house, I think it was in WA, that you'd had on the, you know, we all do these private jobs. You said, I've got enough work. I think there's enough fee in this to last me about six months. And I don't know what's going to happen then. And here you are much later. And on your um, Q&A for the, the, your presence here, you talked about not being interested in business. I don't believe you, mm -hmm. that you're not interested in the operation of the practice. Mm -hmm. Because to grow a practice like the one you've made with fabulous clients, you have to find a way to get to them. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the growth of the practice from that project. Um, to today, through hairdressing salons, through your own practice, building mm. that office building, and, and, and like, as Leone said last week, how did it happen? Mm. Um, um, I think what, I mean, I think, I lo I, first of all, I love these kind of conversations in these lectures, because I always see these people and think, how did you do it? What, what are your tips? Um, when I say I'm not interested in the business, what I'm talking about is I don't check the bank accounts, I don't like um, doing fee agreements or negotiating fees. I acknowledge that we need all that stuff to make the business work, and therefore we have a really fantastic general manager in office who does all that for me. She, if, I, if I was to organise the fees, I would always underquote, because I'd go and give in very quickly. Um, and I'm sort of not interested in that part of it. What, what I love doing is I, I really love drawing. That's my kind of... <coughs> Passionate, and I do everything I can to draw a couple of hours a day. And with a practice of 45 people, that's pretty hard. I could easily spend my day on marketing or doing lunches and stuff. So I, I don't do business lunches. I don't do many dinners. 
I generally do my work and, and draw and design and review drawings. Um, I'm involved with every project in our office. I, I don't check every drawing, but uh, there's a point where I'll check the whole bunch of drawings in one go. So sometimes that takes me two weeks solid to check every drawing. That's kind of what, I mean, I'm kind of an, an architect. That's what I like doing. I like doing architecture, I like doing interiors. Um, I like getting down to the, the finest detail. I like working with consultants. I love getting on site, you know, and climbing around a scaffold with a pair of running shorts on at seven in the morning is like just like heaven for me. I love doing that sort of stuff. Um, I also uh, always set up the business when I left Hassel uh, to be you know, a good practice and a sizable practice. I never had in my mind that I was going to be working on my own, although that's obviously how it started. And, um, and there were kind of some things that happened really that were fortunate, and again, I didn't really plan it, but they look, looking back now, it was smart. Um, one of them was uh, I started doing development applications for people that wanted to do you know, four to six apartments, and I really liked that scale of job. I still like it now. And they were always being onsold, so people would do the DA, they would sell it on, and then the next person would buy it, and, and they wouldn't engage me to go any further, and the design would be kind of slaughtered. And it started just you know, tearing me up. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. I have to find a developer who believes in quality, that wants to do things that are out of the box, that, that wants a creative solution. And I thought Dr. Quek from Fraser's would be the right person. And so I wrote to him, he didn't respond, I wrote again and again. And then one day I called and, and he said, I've got a job for you and it's to furnish an apartment that we can't sell in Lumiere. And we did that and jumped in and it was a lot of fun and it sold the, to the first buyer that walked in the door. And it was kind of at the bottom of the Lumiere building so it was uh, compromised by some big transfer columns. It was an awful planned apartment, but we could see a clever way of resolving that through interior design. And then he asked us to do another one and another one, and then we got the interiors of um, the Jean Neuville building, um, mm. Central Park West, and we did that. And then that kind of allowed us to get into larger projects, and then he gave us our own building. But it kind of worked through little steps like that for us, and I think that's how everybody really does it. Um, but the other thing that I just, I really love detail, so doing the interiors is essential and um, that's kind of grown our company as well. Yeah. And at a point we just said, we don't want to do interiors in other people's buildings anymore, we want to do our own and that's how it really works now. Yeah. So um, William mentioned the Lumiere building which is a project by Foster and Partners in, in the city in Sydney. Um, but I'm just thinking again about the references I spent a bit too much time last night reading the, the Q&A. Mm. Um, every one of your references is a dead white guy. Mm. I wonder if you could talk about dead white architects for a minute and how they've shaped you and what the future might hold for architecture in terms of is the dead white guy a dead thing or is it a kind of growing thing? Mm. So I think, I think John's talking about Luca here, Mies van der Rohe, um, Albert Alto. Dead. Dead, dead, <laughs> white, male. Um, there's just, there's, there's so much out there, isn't there? There's just like so much to look at. And, to, and I think what, what I see with those people, like I really love Lewis Kahn at the moment. And, I, and for me, it's this period where I go through, where I, I, I've loved Lewis Kahn for the last couple of years. And I, I was never interested before that. I just couldn't, I didn't have one remote interest in it at all. And people would say, you'd like it. I say, I don't. And Alto's only been this year. This is the first year I've liked Alto. True, true. And then, and then what I do is I'll, you know, probably obsessive like you say, I'll get books, I'll read the books. At the moment, I'm going through the Lewis Kahn lectures and listening to those. And I just love it. And it's kind of completely influencing my work. What, what I particularly like about people that have had a long career is that you can see phases in their career and can study those. So... There's, this, um, there's a period in Alto's work where he has these monumental buildings that are just, you know, very, very different to the early work, and I love seeing that. There's obviously, you know, I kind of get Architecture Review every, every week and all the Australian, every month and all the Australian mags and enjoy seeing what's happening locally as well. Mm. 
but I do, I do love looking back on those great masters and learning from them. Mm. So you mentioned also, um, I'm going to keep referring to your Q&A about your obsession with drawing on Saturday. Mm. And I guess uh, there's this culture of architects being a bit obsessive. Mm. Um, so William's office is in a very prominent street in Sydney. It was a shortcut out of the city for me to avoid some traffic to head off um, to my old home. And the lights are always on. Mm. It's a kind of, it's a bit, it's a bit Foster-esque in that sense, in that Unfortunately, it's a 20, I don't know if it's a 24-7 office like that, but it's definitely a kind of 7 till 10 place, and that's just downstairs, and then the lights go on in William's um, home upstairs. How do you find time for the dog? He's got a great dog. Mm. How does this work? Mm. How do we find time for work and a kind of ethical work balance for those that we charge with delivering great projects mm. and a kind of their life as well as your own life? Hmm. Um, well, I, I, um, I, really, I really love my job. I completely love drawing and being involved with the studio. And so I've really been going for 20 years now on my own. And for that time, I've probably worked between 75 and 80 hours a week. So I work really long hours. And my day starts off with a run with the dog in the park and I'll go to work at 7.30 and I'll generally go home for dinner and then pop downstairs. And uh, uh, by the way, going home means like a 20-minute walk, 20-second walk. As, as I live upstairs. <laughs> I'll go home and take, a, yeah. take an hour off and probably three nights of the week I'll go back down and just potter around with things. Um, what we try to do in the studio is to not have people work late unless they want to play with something or, you know, if there's that inevitable deadline for a tender or something that... Mm. It will happen through then. And then as we've grown, we're 45 people now, so we've got probably about four competitions on a year. And that's there, yeah, gruelling, really. You work long hours, and um, that requires the team to keep going. Um, as for, for my kind of love, it's, you know, 7.30 to 9 is drawing in the mornings, and then at night time, it's, it's my drawing time. So yeah. I, find, I find that very relaxing. I find it very enjoyable. Um, in, again, in that obsessive way of working, I, um, if I'm designing, I, it's sort of like I feel like I'm breathing it. It's, it's kind of, you know, right in me all the time, and and I really love kind of immersing myself in that way. Does does the business manager ask you to keep timesheets? Yep. Yeah. Would you be bankrupt if? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, just a, again, I guess a question of um, that thing about the obsessiveness and this passion and this drive and the kind of ethics that go with that. Um, the work that you're doing at the moment ranges from, I kind of felt a bit dirty, like that's, that project is just incredible, the palace. Mm. Um, but you know, you've, the Fraser's project is probably the top notch development um, client with um, Dr. Quick. Um, but you probably, some of the other work is not in that realm. But how do you kind of, what do you learn from something like Judith's project that you've got to take to a pretty spec developer on the foreshore in WA? Like how does, do these things, what's the technique of learning from something and how does it enrich the nasty developer and is it even possible? Mm. Um, I, I, don't, I actually don't know the answer just yet. But mm. what I... Um how the project's changed me is I f feel like um, on one level it was just a lot of fun. I really, I really enjoyed it and I've kind of, it's ignited this idea of having a lot of fun. <laughs> it sounds very basic, doesn't it? But I can tell you what I did. One of our projects is we decided we would work in an area called Dulwich Hill on an old railway line and get involved with this low budget uh, for, not affordable housing in the sense of it being a social housing scheme, but low-cost housing that, ha that was permeated with all these social agendas. And, um, and we're building it, and it's about three-quarters built, mm. and it's no fun building it. It's, um, you know, it's the toughest DNC, the roughest DNC contractors you've ever met, the dirtiest construction site, everything's a fight all the time. And I just thought... I'd have to sit down with these guys and say, I don't need to do this, really. Mm. This is, I'm doing it because I want to do it. I don't have to. 
can we make it a bit more fun? Mm. Um, and, and I had that conversation a couple of months ago and it's been much more fun. So that's kind of what I'm out to do at the moment. I'm looking for projects where we can be creative, we can have fun, we can, um, we can do things that are unusual. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a couple of projects we're doing at the moment that aren't quite Indigo Slam, but are almost there. It's really interesting that things come out of the woodwork as well. Yeah. So, um, so Indigo Slams spurred two more interesting projects for uh, other architects next door. Um, so there's the Derbeck Block Jaggers slash um, John Wardle um, mm. Architects mm. project, which mm. is kind of, again, incredible uh, mm. construction work. So we know where Indigo Slam and that site is going. Um, what, what do you take into the future? I mean, Judith is a one-of-a-kind pretty much on the planet. Mm. Um, she's not Aussie John. Mm. Um, she's not... Um, you know, there are clients out there who have similar budgets. That budget's a secret. Mm. I wanted to ask him, but I know he won't answer. Um, but, you know, if someone like Judith came along with zero money but the same ambition. How might you ta tackle that? Um, look, I think the... You know, I'm sort of working on two houses at the moment. One of them is high budget, one is not. And what, I, what I'm doing, and I think I do this for most of the projects, I'm trying to find out what the real problem is. So on one house, what we really have to do is... There's, <coughs> There's an amazing view, and they don't want to, you know, lose any moment of their view. But also have to manage privacy, and uh, it's hard to build and all that stuff. So this kind of trying to unravel what the real problem is, mm. and then how can you allow the house to express that? So if it were a really low project, budget project, I don't think that that means it has to be. Um, it doesn't have to be special. It just probably means you have to stay with very tried and tested and proven ways of building and then build an amazing space out of it. Mm. One of the projects is, um, it's, we're not, it's not about the building, it's about the courtyard that we're building. Now, in a way, that's for free. Uh, there's no cost to building the courtyard because it's just going to be grass, actually. Um, but, the, but the architecture is... is um, the walls that create that space and then what is that space doing and how does it work. Mm. So there's, some things don't cost a lot actually, some things are really expensive. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap up with a funny question. I think it's a funny question. Mm. So, um, and Anthony was right, as we were walking out of the cafe, um, this guy said, are you going up to the lecture? And we said, yeah, yeah. He said, apparently, you know, Australia's greatest architect is speaking there. So, and I jokingly said, because I've known William a while, I said, oh, he's only the second best. <laughs> so who's the next best architect? And what, what does the future hold for Australian architecture? Mm. The next best Australian architect. After you, or the next one? Uh, that you... I don't think I'm there at all. Look, I, th I think that, you know, I think John Wardle's amazing. I think Neil Durback is amazing. I think... Um, Grimshaw's in Australia is doing incredible work. Um, I'm sort of mostly, I probably know, I know more about the New South Wales architects than other ones, but I think they're all doing incredible work. I, every year I go to the awards, I just when, you, when the shortlist comes out for the awards, I think, oh my God, everything is so good. It's really like an amazing calibre of work. I, I, I'm also going to put a caveat on that and say, um, I think... Um, the top end of our architecture is great. I think our, our average architecture is shocking. It's terrible. And I think that, you know, as much as we're building beautiful buildings within the city, we're building many more disgraceful buildings and some people need to be slapped. Mm. That's OK. Um, well, I'm going to leave. I don't want to end uh, with uh, that. Uh, no, no, but <laughs> well, we started on a highlight. I think um, I'm going to ask you all to uh, slap your hands together and thank you uh, for a fabulous. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, John. Thanks, William. It's my duty now to move on to something I know you're all anticipating, and that's to tell you who tonight's ARC I Spy winner is. 
and that is Danielle Chavino. So well done. Now, thank you. Danielle. And as Adam mentioned last week, I wasn't here, but I heard tell that he mentioned it. Uh, we're announcing the overall winner of the competition and the lucky recipient of a private tour of the Hayes and Scott iconic mid-century Jacoby House and some one-on-one -on -one time with the team of the Asia Pacific Design Library is Stefan Tuck. Uh, my final word for this evening is to invite you to hear more about architecture and attend a semester one visiting critic lecture that's happening at the University of Queensland by Virginia Sanfratello of California-based practice, Raphael Sanfratello, and he's going to give this next Friday. And it's about, um, is it entitled Crafting the Future? And it will focus on the future of crafting 3D printed architecture and the built environment through the use of innovative, uh, accessible, recyclable materials. So please register through Eventbrite and make, and you can find the link also on the school's website. And on that note, thanks for coming here uh, yourselves tonight and we look forward to seeing you for the 2018 UQ Architecture Lecture Series. Thank you and enjoy your evening.